All right. Good morning. Wow. Okay. Let's try that again. Good morning. Morning. All right. Cool. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, uh, my name is Brent Williams. I'm a director at Click Studios, web design and development agency here in Colorado and also in Chicago. Um, and both on behalf of us and then Ghostbot Check, who's awesome space you're in, uh, we're just super excited to have you all here. As a group of us were beginning to talk about, oh no. Okay. Oh, cool. Perfect. I was like, we just started. We already have a problem. Um, no, but as we were, you know, a group of us were kind of getting started and thinking about topics that would be interesting, um, product process just kept coming up, uh, especially uh, with Mr. Taylor Linnell and some other folks. And so we're really excited to have you all here to talk about that. Um, and we're really fortunate to have four awesome panelists. So I guess just to get started, can we get a hand for our awesome panelists? They've come out and spent a lot of time. Thank you. All right. So with that, um, a couple things just to like logistical items. Um, one, if you see, and I, I hope it's not too tough to see if it is, um, I, I, you know, maybe like walk up to the side and try to capture that link. There's a link at the top of all the slides. Um, and that will allow you to submit questions for Q&A. So we will see those over here and you can upvote or downvote questions at that link. So if you think someone asked a good question, uh, feel free to upvote it. If you are jealous that they asked such a good question, you can downvote it. Um, but regardless, at the uh, end of the session, we'll, we'll take some questions and really try to focus on the ones that you all find the most interesting. Um, other thing is there's another link at the bottom up there. Uh, it's bit.ly bit.ly forward slash dsw dash product and if you go there and drop in your email we'll make sure to get you the deck uh, and some takeaways uh, from this session so two links to think about otherwise just enjoy yourself uh, and you know noodle on some of the you know interesting conversations that we're gonna have um, from there a couple other housekeeping items uh, one just want to say thank you to our sponsors uh, Denver Startup Week is free, as you know, um, and it can only be free because we are really fortunate to get awesome sponsors. Um, the, <laughs> see Aaron in the back uh, for the product tracks, like, yes. Um, but we've been super lucky to get these awesome sponsors and specifically for this session, uh, Capital One is the sponsor for the product track. So if you see someone from Capital One, you know, say something nice, or, or, or don't, but just be nice. Um, and we're just really excited to have them. And also a big thank you to GhostBot Check. Um, this is definitely one of the cooler spaces that I've ever gotten to host an event in. And a lot of these chairs look super comfortable. Um, a couple more sponsors up there, but without further ado, um, I wanna tell you kind of the flow. We are gonna have each of our panelists talk for like five minutes at most about their product process um, and they all have a kind of a different approach there and we're just going to cycle through those quickly so we won't take questions then um, once we hop into the panel we'll start doing questions uh, and, and discussing some of those processes but without further ado I want to invite up Christine who's going to uh, be our first uh, panelist and let's give her a round of applause hi um, my name is Christine Hedinger. I'm a product manager at Havenly. For those of you that don't know what Havenly does, just a brief overview. Um, we do interior design, but it's all done online. So when you think about the traditional interior design model, it's really expensive um, and very time consuming. Somebody actually comes into your home. What Havenly does is try to make that more accessible for everybody. So it's a much lower price point. Um, you work with your designer online, they curate this um, shopping basket for you, and then you can purchase it all through our website. So that's Havenly in a nutshell. Um, what I'm going to talk about is our process. You guys probably all saw waterfall up there and wanted to boo me off the stage, but hear me out. Um, so we are an agile shop by default, um, true and true, very agile, but there are certain projects where waterfall actually works a little bit better. And in terms of what I want to cover, I'm going to go over waterfall because everyone else is going to talk about more agile processes. And when we kind of default to waterfall over agile is when we're working with external partners. So we have one partner in particular, Airbnb. 
Um, we had two very different projects. One of them was run very agile. Um, it was a design process for hosts, so, so that way they could up-level their listings, they could charge a higher price point, better for Airbnb, better for the host. That was a fairly unknown um, and kind of scary project, so agile worked really well for that. But in terms of doing Waterfall, um, we had a different project that we worked on with them, which was an e-commerce platform. An e-commerce platform is pretty well known. Um, there's not a lot of like scary gotchas on an e-commerce platform. There's a lot of different people who have it out there. It's a well-known pattern. In that case, and we were also working up against an external deadline where they were going to do this keynote speech and unveil this. So in that case, we actually found Waterfall worked a lot better and the client was much more comfortable in working with, a, working with us um, using that methodology. So Waterfall is kind of, if you don't know, scoping the hell out of it up front, managing it to a deadline, um, and going through all of the different processes in a Waterfall-like fashion. The one deviation we did from this process was we tested intermittent, intermittently. So rather than waiting till the very end, which imposes a lot of risk, as you know, which is why Waterfall is not incredibly popular, um, we tested throughout the cycle to make sure that we were on track for this very public um, unveiling, which for a startup is a very uh, scary thing when you're working with a very big company and have a lot to lose. So kind of a quick overview. I hope I'm not over my five minutes, but yeah. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Scott Williamson. I am the VP of product at SendGrid. I've been at SendGrid a little over five years. Uh, so when I started, we were about 140 people, sub 20 million in revenue on our C round. And we had three product managers who sort of loosely reported into a VP of marketing, but I was the first product leader hired there. Uh, now we're 450 people, post IPO guiding to 140 some million next year. And there's a little over 30 people on my team. So it's been an unbelievable scaling uh, learning experience uh, and an opportunity to, to install a system and hire the team. And what you're looking at behind me is a very high level description of how we work at SendGrid. This has been an evolution. Uh, some of this is sort of secret sauce within SendGrid, but much of it is best practice pieced together from places like Amazon and Intuit and um, Cooper Design. If you saw Jeff Patton's uh, talk the other day, he has a story mapping technique that we've, we've uh, borrowed. So just try to borrow what we think works, put it together in a way that it works for us and our product and our culture. So there's at a high level three phases, learn, build and grow. From the product standpoint, we really emphasize the learn phase. Our PMs spend at least half their time here, which is pretty unique. Most PMs I talk to probably are 90% in build. Uh, so we really overemphasize that build, the learn phase, particularly on the product front. There's three steps to it. The first is uh, what we call discovery. This is where you're assimilating all the data you're getting from customers, from stakeholders, from product usage. And we ask the PMs to stack rank a list of what we call opportunities, pull the top opportunities off the list, and you go through a phase called problem validation. As you can see, we separate problem from solution. Uh, we want PMs to really get in the headspace of the problem before they start thinking about the solution. A lot of times this all gets mixed together and if you do that, you can skip too quickly to solution. Uh, so we ask them to interview 10 customers here at least and create something we call an opportunity canvas, which is a one pager that describes who's the target user, what problem do they have, uh, why do we need to do this now, um, what are our risks, what's the upside, how are we going to take this to market, like make sure that all stands up together before you start designing a solution. Once you get to solution, then you create a story map along with the design and you shop that with at least 10 more customers. So before we've taken anything to build, we've talked to at least 20 target customers. Build, I won't, I won't elaborate on that. It's a pretty typical agile scrum process. And then launch 
is uh, you know, product marketing drives and we have launch plans and, and messaging docs and all the like. Uh, when you get to 20 PMs and 10 designers and 100 plus engineers, it's important to have a, a standard way of working. And so we've worked hard to articulate that. I think it's the right mix between process and creativity. Uh, but you, wanna, you want an environment where a new PM or a new designer or a new engineer can pop in and know how, how to work the right way. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Michael Fashionello. Uh, real quick, I just counted. There are about 10 open seats up front if you're standing in back and uh, don't want to be. Uh, and I'll be talking about design sprints today. That's not something that I would say is a product management process, more of a product management tool that can fit into any of these processes. Uh, we actually ran a project, uh, a, a design sprint of last December with, uh, with SendGrid, where I don't know where within, their, within the SendGrid way we fit in, but it's definitely something that helps condense the learning and building by doing it all in one sort of uh, one go where it's incredibly good at getting customer feedback um, based on defining a problem, getting a solution, um, putting that solution in front of folks, and then going through and, and getting validation uh, that either that, that solution was good or really, really bad, um, but then all the qualitative stuff that comes along with it. Um, and, and so that can be a really good way to make sure that you're building uh, not just a thing, but uh, something that your, your customers will actually want, and that's sort of central to it. Uh, if you've read The Lean Startup, I think Jake Knapp, who coined, coined the design sprint, might have just read that and was like, how do I put that into a week-long process? Um, I know that's not what he did. He, he sort of iterated through it, but um, at any rate, at Click, we, we uh, are a design and development shop, as, as Brent said, design and build websites, apps, software. And this is one of the things that we do with our clients uh, when, when they're struggling with, with figuring out what should they build um, and, and why should they build it. Uh, going to the next slide, Brent, uh, we actually did this with the city of Denver and, and it, was, it was pretty cool. We did this a year ago today. Well, I don't know if the dates match up, but with a group of all of you to basically help us figure out how to do it, we split it into like 10 teams and everybody ran a miniaturized design sprint where we came up with a bunch of ideas, sketched it out. And then now uh, if you go to Denver Public Work dot or Denver Public whatever, you've got the cards in front of you. Uh, you, can, you can go around and see the over 300 pieces of art around town. Uh, and so we're just giving them a quick plug because we love the city of Denver. Denver Arts and Venues has supplied a lot of the spaces that you've probably been in here today. And then uh, also we're just showing off some of our work. So uh, that is that. And then uh, I guess I will hand it off to the next person. All righty. Well, first and foremost, uh, Thank you guys for coming here. I am a product manager at Go Spot Check. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to host Ian here. Um, hope you enjoy the food and beverages and um, take some to go if you would like. Uh, I think it's kind of becoming a battle of process right now, so this is going to be exciting. Uh, we do one that's kind of beastly. Uh, we call it Scaled Agile Framework or SAFE. Um, but to give you an idea of why we chose SAFE, I think it gives you, the, if I can give you the context of the business, um, because we have four powerful stakeholders that use our product. So Go Spot Check is a real-time field execution platform. So the folks that go to restaurants or go to liquor stores to deliver Anheuser Bush or Pepsi, or they go and clean up a building, so like facilities management, all the way to going to hospitals, you have these folks called field reps that use a mobile device to track their work. So our focus is really on the deskless workforce, but because there are many levels to these major organizations, we have four primary stakeholders. We have the reps that use our mobile applications, Android and iOS. We then have the people that manage their tasks. So where are they going? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? Then you have the people that kind of take all this data and do the analytics, the insights. And the last you have like the decision makers that review everything and kind of make the strategic decisions. So because of all these different stakeholders and all these different platforms, um, our product is quite confusing. So if you look at our board over there, so we actually have um, in SAFE, we have a real life board that we put up. Uh, it actually is every quarter. 
It's consisted of six sprints. Uh, the sixth sprint is kind of like the innovation sprint. So right now my team's upstairs doing a hackathon uh, to kind of play around for the next two days because we've gone through our full quarter. But starting next week, we start the quarter over again. And that is two full days. Uh, we're a company of roughly 160 people, almost 120, over, over 60% partake. Um, the rig reason we want to do safe because every single lane up there is an agile team. And that's just engineering product and design and QA. That does not include commercial. And we really struggled with how do we get commercial folks involved in our process, give that transparency, that line of sight. And this is, will be our third quarter doing safe. And it has transformed the, um, how we articulate our problem, how we solve the problem. And we have um, dramatically reduced the confusion, um, but it also has a lot of ceremony and there's a lot of things involved with what we do. So we also have, it's very few standing meetings. Um, we do have like demos every other sprint. So we're making sure that we're keeping track. And then those strings you see uh, between the swim lanes are dependencies. So when we demo, it allows the other agile teams to really make sure that we're all kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, so it is a lot to do. Um, it's fascinating. It's been huge for us, uh, but super excited to kind of hear how we compare our processes. Awesome. Um, every time I see that board, I'm like, okay, it's a art, arts and crafts all over again. Um, awesome. Well, so first of all, thank you all for sharing kind of a, a little overview to level set. Um, I kind of want to get the panel started by just talking about, so obviously all four of you utilize a different process uh, for a different reason. But inside of your own product process, how do you, or at what frequency do you reflect back on the process, uh, you know, and, and begin to think about, okay, this is wor working or, uh, you know, things aren't going exactly how I would hope. Like, what's the frequency there and, what, and how do you all think about that? So we... As I, as I mentioned, we're on the Agile process. So we have what we call oh. retros. Okay, let's try this again. So we have retrospectives every two weeks. Um, our sprint cycles are on a two-week sprint. So every time we have our retrospective, it's a good time to kind of check in on process a bunch of other things as well, particularly if we've just launched a big project or anything like that. Um, I think you constantly need to be checking in on your process and make sure that it's working. Um, I heard a podcast probably two years ago that talked about minimum viable process, and I really liked that and it really resonated with me. Um, you don't want to have so much that people can't remember the process, but you want to have just enough so that way it aligns people and kind of keeps them on track. So in terms of a cadence, I think every two weeks is a good time to kind of check in. It makes it so that way it's not a long, arduous meeting once a quarter. Um, if you're constantly just making little tweaks, deciding what to kill, deciding what to keep, it kind of keeps you all honest and moving in the same direction. If I think back over the five years, we probably made at least minor adjustments every six months. You know, from my standpoint, working across a bunch of teams, her description makes sense when you're within a small team where you can adjust. But if you have to train up 20 PMs and 10 designers and 100 engineers, you got to be careful about how often you do that. Um, but I totally agree. You don't want to have the process leading the thing. Like the process should be serving whatever phase you're at and whatever you're trying to do. So I think incremental evolution every couple times a year makes sense. And it's probably about the cadence uh, that we've been on. I don't know that I have any thoughts on cadence. Um, I just say when, when we're doing product stuff, we just try to at least uh, define a few principles that we want to make every decision around. Um, whether that's, we want this to be the most frictionless thing possible, um, but, or what have you, we want people to get the most, uh, insightful information to make decisions or depending on what the product is. Um, and I have a little bit different perspective because I'm not just ever working on one product, going and helping people work on different products. Um, but always keeping that true North, North, uh, North Star, that's the word I'm looking for, um, in mind. And then any sort of uh, additional features, functionality, making sure that that all butts up against that and it actually helps achieve that. Um, that's, I think, just important for the way that I think about product. 
um, and also just not over featuring something. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that, uh, well, Facebook is a good example where there's every single feature and then Instagram came along and they're like, what's the one feature people actually care about? Let's do that really well. And now Instagram's driving all of Facebook basically. So uh, I don't know if that answers it, but you can take it as you will. I would love a show of hands. Who has seen the safe diagram? Like, all right, so that's quite a few. And you know it looks like a Pollock painting. Hey, there are so many things you can do in this safe framework. So we are pretty selective on kind of what components we bring into our system. Um, but we, at the end of every quarter, uh, we have kind of a retro on the previous quarter safe process. And we probably use, I'm looking at some other PMs around here, probably 50% of what we have with safe. Uh, and so as we get better at safe, we're evaluating what can we bring in? And then we have kind of two products. So we, they call them programs and safe. We have the core go spot check program. And then I lead the, the hi-fi team, which is a new product. And so now we kind of have this emerging um, complication between our two programs. And I think what will be really interesting as we go on subsequent quarters is our programs get more intertwined, how we scale that together. And so it's a combination of being candid, transparent, everyone retros on safe. So commercial QA design, engineering product, even leadership. They're all in this room debating how it went. We take those action items and we actually have dedicated folks um, in the company that help us manage that process to make sure that we're not dropping the ball on always improving how we build product. Awesome. Um, so I guess, and this can go to anyone, but are there times when, or things that happen that are cues to you all that, all right, uh, we need to adhere a little less to the process. As I heard Scott say, uh, you know, the, the process is, should really be serving, you know, our needs and not the other way around, but are there, yeah, like times or specific issues that seem to arise and you're like, all right, we need to loosen things up a little bit. Uh, slow velocity is one of them. If things just aren't moving as fast as you think they should, that might be a signal that process is getting in the way. We ask for feedback on it. So if PMs are frustrated or designers or engineers are frustrated, that's a signal that maybe there's a tweak you can make. Um, I, th those are a couple obvious ones. Uh, so, so this is where it kind of gets a little beastly with uh, safe. Um, if there's like a major break in our roadmap, so the, this, the, new pro the program I lead is kind of has one foot in R&D, one foot in kind of getting our product to market. And we always learn new information with our alpha partners. And sometimes some big surprises pop up. And when we do that, we actually have to bring what we call the roadmap committee down to this room. And we have to essentially present what we want to break in our roadmap. And there's a whole ceremony of us actually moving post-its on that board. That board's like almost nightmarish if you look at it. Um, and so there is some inflexibility with that because that's like every two weeks. So our ability to move really quick is kind of stymied, but you always have that trade-off. Is transparency and cohesion more important than super agility, um, especially when we are dealing with, with enterprise contracts? Remind me of the question. <laughs> I guess we'll remind for everybody. Uh, no, it was just if there are specific things that come up, so it could be inside of a design sprint or inside of safe that you're, are kind of like a warning flag that, all right, we might be getting a little too tied into the process and we might, might need to make an adjustment. Well, there are, there are times in design sprints that you can tell people just feel really awkward in some of the stuff that they're going through. Um, and, and in those cases, you just have to figure out what is the actual thing this is supposed to be serving? What is it trying to get at? Is there a different way that I can help get that insight? Um, and in some cases, it's just force people to do it and feel awkward for a second and help them get through that awkwardness to actually get that insight. Um, Jake Knapp will advocate that you just stick to the process the first 10 times you do a design sprint and do it regimentedly so that you're not trying to figure out the process, you're just trying to solve the problem. And I think in a lot of cases, that's good to do with process. If you have a process, stick to it until it's painfully obvious that you should change it um, and, and then change it. Uh, I think that that's kind of the way that I look at it within design sprints and just in general. Yeah. Cool. Um, no, yes, maybe, you don't have to. Uh, sure, so we, we tend to throw out process if it's not working pretty quickly. Um, Scott mentioned this, we're a pretty small team, so we can afford to 
kind of be a little bit more responsive when things aren't going well within a process. Um, so I mentioned every two weeks we have a sprint. We talk about, not always talk about process, we'll talk about projects as well. Um, but I do think the team is pretty comfortable in responding to and voicing if a process isn't working. And so as a PM team, we'll look and see what can we improve in this process to make it a little bit better and ease everybody's concerns. And I'm just going to go ahead and warn the audience just because I, I didn't see a lot of people using the links up there. Um, so after this next question, I'm going to ask for a hand raise just to start uh, getting some QA going. But uh, so as we transition to, to more specifics, um, there are a million tools out there, million, million, million. Uh, are there any that, that you guys are using that you actually are enjoying um, in terms of managing the process? And uh, what are you using them for? Taylor's like, I don't like any of them. So, yeah. um, so there's like a special tool where we were a pivotal tracker. I, I promise you there is benefits of safe. I am probably not the best advocate up here. Um, but there, there is a new tool that we're uh, transitioning to made specifically for safe. Uh, I think it's a, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's gonna be a lot of learning on this tool. Um, it's not very intuitive, but it is custom made for safe. Um, so we're very curious how it's going to roll out. Um, but the main reason why we had to change tools is that Piddle Tracker is really good. But when you have eight different swim lanes up there um, and you, have, you share QA or design resources, it becomes a nightmare kind of managing all that. So uh, the tool we're moving to is that it's not proprietary. Anything, it's called Agile Craft. Uh, uh, we've long used Jira in the build phase and continue to. Uh, the front end was largely unmanaged until very recently. We, we started using a product called AHA, which does a pretty nice job of, of managing the front end of the product process. And we've mapped that to these phases of the SendGrid way. And so it's, it's coming in, it, it, it's evolving right now. It, we've only been using the tool a quarter or two, but so far so good as far as managing the front end of it. And then it just integrates into Jira when you get into the build phase. When you say the front end, you mean like the insights, learning, research? Yeah, I, it has an idea portal. You okay. can manage things from an idea to an opportunity to a release to an epic, cool. which is sort of the flow that we move through to a story, to a task. Um, so we've got things mapped to it now. Cool. And then you can report on it. You can see where teams are. You can see what's in each phase, which is important for someone like myself. Awesome. So this is a bit of a painful question for me because we've changed tooling a lot, um, but I'll tell you what we're using now. So uh, what we're using now at the kind of product steering committee level is we're just using Google Slides. Um, so this is kind of very top end. Um, it could be something that's well-defined and we're just giving an update or it could be, hey, we have this idea. Here's how we're kind of framing it up. What do you guys think? Is this something we should move forward on? Um, so that's kind of at the product steering committee level. And then one layer down, we have this tool called Monday, um, and that's where we track all of the different um, projects, different dependencies. We leave notes in there for each other, all of that kind of good stuff. And then for the engineering team itself, we use Jira. Um, at my previous company, we used Pivotal Tracker. We use Jira at this company. Um, Pivotal Tracker, I like a little bit better because it's a little bit simpler. Um, Jira, you almost need a training course in it to actually use it as effectively. Um, as it's kind of laid out. Yeah, totally. Well, being that a design sprint is a week long and uh, there's, there's, it's a tool itself and a process, but a tool, uh, we don't use software to really manage that. Uh, you, I, I have seen people do Trello to, to manage the process. I do think it's important that if you do run a design sprint as a tool within the product, uh, toolkit, you get some buy-in from everybody that's participating um, and using a Google Sheet is really good to put that process in there. Uh, and then whiteboards, writing it up on the whiteboard is obviously really good. And then going through the process, uh, the well, P-A-P-E-R is probably the, the best thing to use. Somebody got that joke. Thank you. Who did you steal that joke from, Michael? Uh, Edward Tufte. Yeah, there we go. P A P E R paper uh, for those that don't spell well like me. Um, yeah. So I guess then like, well, let's pause there and, and, and take a little bit of Q and A. So anybody have a, a, a thought yet or a question that they're noodling on and want to be the brave first one? 
Yeah, what, did you put it in? Ah, oh, love it. Oh, lost the phone. Uh, oh, we got a couple actually. And thank you, person in the front row there. Uh, okay, so what is a, and this is for anybody, what is a product manager's role in process versus a project manager's? So product versus project manager as it comes to the role in the process. Uh, for us, the product manager owns the customer outcome. They need to, they're, they're the lead on the learn phase. They're there to prioritize the problems that understand them, work with the designer to figure out the solution and then kind of see it all the way through build and launch and just continue to represent the, the customer and business outcome. Project managers for, for SendGrid tend to be involved in the build phase. Uh, they're essentially, it's a hybrid role. They do scrum master stuff. And then they also serve a function we call agile project management where they're working to nail down dependencies across teams, make sure that milestones are hit, report back on status, that kind of thing. So they do a combo of scrum mastering and then project management once it gets into build. So our product managers are both product managers and project managers. As I mentioned, we have a small team. So uh, yeah, like a, a single mother on the team. I do both. <laughs> um, we, so we, we have a pretty strong distinction between product management and project management. Uh, management. Um, so we actually have several amazing folks at the company that we call technical project managers. And since we have enterprise customers like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and there's a Bush, uh, our product only goes so far. And that's kind of where you draw the distinction. Is it standardized? Is it uh, scalable? And is it um, like testable? Is a product in our world that a PM can own? Um, but when we have a ton of reporting or a ton of custom workflows, that actually goes to a technical project manager. So they're the ones that we kind of hand off to. What's really cool though, is that it's an amazing breeding ground for us to find new features. Because they'll have customers that say, we would love this workflow. Or if you could report this way, that would be huge for us. So we have a very tight knit kind of cross team communication on, uh, these are the features we're getting a lot of requests. We're making these a ton of time. Could you standardize it? And that's kind of how our two sides of the house uh, work together. Awesome. Outside of design, design sprints, I can comment on this a little bit. Um, I think the project manager tends to be somebody that, that is managing interactions with our clients and also managing a timeline and then sort of making sure that timeline goes through with all the people that need to do it. And then like a marriage, you've got somebody who's working directly with them to figure out the what and the why for what the things should be. Um, but I think that those things blur a lot and they should blur a lot. Um, and if you're being super regimented about that role, then uh, you might not be getting as many good ideas or good implementation as you could. Um, I, uh, we'll do a couple more, another awesome one. So with and the, the question is, how do you discuss process with your stakeholders to set expectations? So we've committed to this process, you know, it's going to impact when things are delivered, how they're delivered, what gets prioritized. How do you set those expectations with them uh, early in that process? That's what the question is. How do you discuss process with stakeholders to set expectations? Um, it's a hard line to draw, of course, because you don't want to get so in the weeds. Nobody really wants to see how the sausage is made, but um, it does need to be enough so that way they have insight into why you're making the trade-offs that you're making, why you're sticking to certain t deadlines, why you're not going to pull an engineer off a project mid-sprint to go work on something else. Um, so I do think that they need to be aware of maybe not so much the process, but kind of the guardrails around that process and how you respect um, other people's time and the timelines and what we've committed to, um, to keep it so it is something that doesn't get jerked around and keeps moving forward in the direction that you want it to. Uh, we've had to sell the hell out of the way we work. Uh, as I mentioned, the learn phase is, is intense. It takes 20 customer calls to get to build. And a at a lot of places people come from, you, you're used to moving through that phase fast. 
and that feels like progress to m many people like oh yeah we we're gonna just go build that and so asking people to be patient through the learn phase has been an adjustment it's taken a long time for people to get used to it once you get stuff through and then there's you know engineering there's not a lot of chaos in engineering and the launch does what you said it was going to do you gain some credibility for spending that time up front but the first year or so there was a lot of noise about wow you guys are moving so slow like not much is moving in the build so we had to continually come back to it. it's about the customer it's about problems we've got to do this homework so that the we make fewer mistakes down the line where it's much more expensive uh, but it, that can be a hard sell when you're under pressure. I feel like this question was teed up by a, like a safe advocate because I know I have been bashing. I've, I've been very um, honest about safe, um, but by far for internal stakeholders, this is huge because when we go to this board, they know if we push something out because of a customer request or their hair is on fire, that it moves everything down. And they might have, for instance, SSO or single sign-on coming up in Q4 for a customer. And Maris, I know this is a really big feature, you guys, um, but it's going to push out SSO to 2019. Are you okay with that? And it makes everyone accountable to kind of what we're building. But being on the other side, on the kind of the, the R&D, uh, we on the external stakeholder world, that's where I think I'm having the, the most um, learnings on kind of how to manage that. Um, because they don't get to see safe. They don't get to see our internal process. And when you build a product that will essentially get in the hands of 20,000 uh, reps for a major company, uh, there it's very hands-on. And so when managing that expectation, it's always, I think it's a maniacal focus on the problem with the discipline for your solution. Now your solution can be fluid, but if you can align on the problem with the external stakeholder, you can move mountains and then they can move mountains for you as a champion within their organizations. Um, because if you have a problem, you can quantify it. Uh, numbers speak volumes. Yeah, I think the importance of communicating the process is in making sure people know what that is and there's not questions, debate, uh, stuff around the process. It's just the problem and you're focused on the problem, focused on finding a solution to that as opposed to how should we do this better. Um, and then as a part of that, I think sharing the process up front, having it documented so people can see it. Uh, and then communicating it all the way through, say it three times, say it a different way, uh, get it in an email, do whatever. And then after you have gone through that entire process, reflect on it with everybody, make sure that it's written down so that you can actually say like, yeah, that didn't work, not just a, an amoebus. Um, what didn't work about our process and reflecting over a week or a month or three months or however long your process is, it's pretty tough if you don't have it written down. Um, but if you do and you're looking at it in that way, then you can start pulling things out. Nice. So uh, two things. One, a reminder, uh, even if you're not asking the question, hop up at the link so you can up or down vote because there's a lot of questions in there and want to be as uh, equitable with answering them as possible. Um, but I want to touch back and this is, uh, gets close to one of the questions, but for, for your teams, as you're looking to pull in insights and customer feedback, there's a lot of questions specifically about how do you manage that? Because it's probably, a, it can be a lot of qualitative data. Sure, you get some quantitative, but often a lot of qualitative data. How do you manage that process? How do you make it as effective and efficient as possible? So it depends on where the, this data or feedback is coming from. So we have um, a very regimented process for internal feedback. Um, we actually have a Slack channel for it, which can get a little bit crazy. Um, we have one on our internal side, and then we also have this designer Slack channel. So we have a bunch of designers that work all over the world, and obviously they're using our tool. So when we think about our customers, it's not only just the end customer who's redesigning their home, it's also the designers who are using using these internal tools that we have built for them. So we kind of have two sides of our system to manage. For the designers, um, you can always count on them to report if something is not going well. You can always count on them to give us some feedback. We're actually really lucky in that. Um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to filter through it, but we have a pretty good process to um, one person mans this channel every week um, and they distill down that feedback for each week. Um, sometimes they'll turn into JIRA tickets. Sometimes they'll be higher level thinking projects of how can we rethink this to make this better. In terms of our clients, um, anytime we're kind of in the discovery phase, we'll, we'll interview users. So similar to what Scott is talking about, although 
probably not quite as long um, as you spend in the discovery phase, but always try to be talking to your customers. So even if you're not um, building something, it's a good idea to just have a regular flow of communication because you never know what might come up. I have a few recommendations on internal stuff. For us, one problem is uh, translating from what the customer says into the form that the product manager can really work with. So for us, that's, it needs to be translated into problem language rather than feature language, uh, which customers usually ask for stuff in the form of a feature. So we ask our teams who are submitting ideas on behalf of customers to try to take a shot at that translation. So rather than just asking for what feature did they ask for, what problem is this trying to solve for them? Can you give an example and, for that, Scott? Mind. Oh, you know, somebody might say, I need this stat to read this way. Why? What are you doing with the stat? Maybe there's some other answer than giving them the stat exactly the way they asked for it. Uh, the, just about any request can have that dimension to it because they interact with you. It's a feature to them. Uh, but what's opaque to us is why. So the more that those teams can go unpack that and give that to us, that's really useful. Uh, so when, when they submit ideas, we ask them to try to take a shot at translating it into problem language. That's one suggestion. Um, we, another one, we have a lot of ways for our customers to provide feedback like NPS. There's an in-app button to provide feedback. We get hundreds of these things a quarter. Really tough to maintain. We actually have a user uh, research group and they take the first shot at uh, tagging them and grouping them so that you can see, okay, here's the biggest bucket of pain. Let's go focus there. It, it helps the PMs deal with this barrage of data. Not everyone has the luxury of that, I recognize, but it's, it's a way that we can sort of filter stuff for PMs. And then the third uh, recommendation is you're gonna have way more ideas than you can deal with, so how do you rank them? We borrowed a system called Rice from Intercom. It's, there's a post about it, you can check it out, but it's reach, impact, confidence, effort. There's a bit of a formula to it. But we ask all the PMs to rank their backlogs in the same way so that they put some thought into why is that number one and can you explain it? And can someone like myself compare across domains? Just a few suggestions for dealing with the barrage of input. I think product managers at Ghostbox Check have an incredible advantage um, when we are able to kind of distill uh, what we want to build because we have a customer success team that manages customers with white glove service. They are the biggest advocate for our customers. We have a software support team that manages the, the mobile application, like the field reps, and they all come to the table with amazing ideas. And then what we try to do as PMs is marry that up with kind of broader themes that we're trying to accomplish for that year, that quarter. And so maybe it's, um, I mean, I'll be, uh, I'll give you a real one. It's like enterprise readiness. How do we scale up our technology? So, you know, the, the Fortune 100 companies in the world have no reason to say we're not going to use you. And we're able to lean on our CSMs that are in the trenches, use them to understand uh, what's going on. But I do think that sometimes there's a friction because CSMs are really focused on uh, making sure their customers are amazing. But we have lots of CSMs with lots of customers and they have conflicting points of view sometimes. And so what's important for the, the PMs is to be emboldened and to say why. You know, I think the five whys is huge, like Scott said. Um, if you tell, tell us where the smoke is, and then we want to come in and put that fire out. Um, that's kind of how we're really evolving, but um, there are growing pains with that for sure. But I couldn't ask for a better CSM and software, team, software support team to kind of feed those up to us on a T. Yeah, I think there's, there's three things that I think about with, with, this, with gathering and, and using feedback. One is have, have a system like Scott mentioned where you're grading that feedback based on some values that you have. Um, and then two would be um, ask, ask the user for trade-offs. So don't just say, what do you want? But would you rather ease of use or would you rather more information? Would you prefer the, the ability to do X, Y, or Z? or uh, this, that, or the other, and having them diametrically opposed um, usually gets to what their true preference is a lot better than just saying, what do you want? 
Um, so I think that is, is really, really helpful. Um, and then the third thing is just always triangulate the data. So if you hear, if you get a, a tell that through analytics that somebody or that something's not working correctly, make a hypothesis, ask questions, or if you, through an interview, get feedback on this, that, or the other, try to figure out why that is by going and looking at analytics or putting out a survey or some, at least getting three points of data that validate and sort of say the same thing and paint the same picture, um, as opposed to just explicitly listening to what your customers want. Um, the cliche and hackneyed thing is uh, Henry Ford's, if you asked what people wanted, they would have told you faster horses when the need was transportation and in, rather than just like looking at that specific feature being four legs that run, um, it was point A to point B and like sort of triangulated that data. Yeah. Awesome. So we have a lot of people, like 10 people really want to know as it relates, I think very similar to this, this process, when you were getting feedback uh, specifically from sales uh, and, and especially as it relates to larger accounts, how do you prioritize things that might be like a one-off feature? Like company A wants this thing that maybe no one else is going to want, but they pay you a ton of money versus if you do that, that's great, but it's not really building the overall value of the product. Um, what's the calculus there? I, I, do you have any insight on how to approach that? <laughs> Yeah. So when we were building um, some of these, like the e-commerce platform and this design process for Airbnb, we actually used it as an opportunity to build some things that we wanted for our, our core design process. Um, and we were lucky in that, at least for the design uh, consult project that we worked on with them. It was very much um, a test and learn. They, they went along with us. Um, we were both in it together and wanted to, to get that kind of feedback. Um, I know that's not always the case when you're working with certain stakeholders. They might be very demanding and want certain things. Um, on the e-commerce platform, it was more of that side. And I think again, we're a small team and they recognized we were a small team. So it was pretty easy to go back to them. Maybe not always easy, but to go back to them and really have them rank um, what was most important. What were the features that they really needed? Um, and again, we used more of a waterfall process for that up front. So they didn't really come in halfway through with a whole new set of requirements. We kind of agreed on them up front, set the timeline and just kind of built it from there. Um, so I don't know if that really answers the question. We also don't really have a sales team at Havenly, um, so not the most applicable. Uh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> I've worked in different environments uh, where sales pressure was more prevalent than other places. Uh, SendGrid happens to be a self-serve business with tens of thousands of customers. So. My main mission is to keep the experience optimal for tens of thousands and not for one or five or even 10. And so I'm loath to add something that adds complexity to the user experience. Um, if we can somehow separate that from the core experience through a service offering or something like that, there you go. Uh, but as a product team, you need to be really careful about not ruining the core experience for demanding customers. Uh, so that's just a piece of advice. Yeah, money's important, revenue's good. Sometimes that should be the tiebreaker, but if it's at the expense of being able to sell it and have a great user experience for hundreds or thousands of customers down the line, be really careful about that. And I wonder for this, I mean, you, Ghostbot Check has a self-service offering, right? Havenly self-service or no? It's kind of complicated, not really. Kind of, kind of, not really, okay. Ghostbot <laughs> Check, not, definitely not. Hybrid self-service. Okay. All right. Interesting. Well, this I, I couldn't agree more with Scott. This one is like tough to like balance that line. Um, because someone's always going to be upset at the end of the day. Someone's not going to get their quota because you didn't build the feature they want because they need to close that deal. Uh, what's really tough for Ghost by Check is that we're a horizontal problem, a problem platform. So we service five verticals: so retail, facilities, uh, CPG, so consumer product goods, Bev Alk, and then we also have this kind of the new medical arm. Um, and you know, for an example, you know, a restaurant, uh, customer says, we'll give you $2 million if you build this feature. That's really tough for PM to, to say no to, but to Scott's point, if we build this, we are then pigeonholed. And so, um, we are very, very lucky to have our technical project managers that kind of kind of bridge that gap. 
So our product can get them 80% of the way there and they may need a custom workflow where these people are notified. We're not ready to prioritize that yet because we don't have enough information um, or we don't know enough about the problem. Um, so our delivery team or our technical project managers kind of bridge that gap. But I think sometimes it's like a drug. It's almost too addictive. And so we lean on them too much. And then we get in a hole where our, you know, our cost of goods sold is now going up dramatically. Um, so it's always that balance of making sure uh, we can close those deals, learn a lot from the future they want, see if we can scale it horizontally, and then uh, release it as a full product. Well, at Click, the product that we're selling is our process. Um, so I, I can kind of talk to that where, well, if you're going to get surgery and you ask the surgeon to do his process differently, he's probably not going to be super comfortable or she in, in executing that process. Um, and you're going to end up with a worse final outcome. Um, so I think in that case, it's, it's just about coaching that particular client or, or, patients that, that let us do it how we are really good at doing it um, and, and letting them know that. But just from an academic perspective for product management, I think um, figure out what your time horizon is where you make decisions. And if it's, and then say, how much money will this make us over that time? Um, and then it could be worth it or, or not. Um, for super short-sighted companies that just need dough right now, probably do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's, that's kind of how I would think about it anyway. Um, so if you're a publicly traded company, probably do it. <laughs> so I think this one specifically for you, Scott, and it, it, it revolves around the, uh, the part of the send grid way where you talk about how much time you all are spending in the learn phase. And the person's question is, you know, how involved are your product managers in the build phase? Because at their company, they feel like they spend a lot of time in the build phase because developers need the product managers to finish stories, to talk about requirements. So one, how do you do that at SendGrid? And two, uh, you know, what advice would you give to someone that wants to make some small tweaks to be able to advocate for more time in the learn phase? Yeah, this, this depends on having the right ratios of PMs to designers to engineers. Over time, we've adopted a, a 1 p.m. to one designer to one scrum team if it's a customer facing thing. Uh, if it's a back end thing, 1 p.m. to two scrum teams, no designer. If you have ratios like that, then you can ask the p.m. to spend a bunch of time out of the building. At least that's my experience. Uh, if you're managing worse ratios than that, then it gets hard. So I know not everyone has the luxury of going all in on this. Um, we also have a system where the PM owns the thing through kind of the high level user story and then the engineering managers take it from there and they break it down into tasks and they farm it out to their engineers. And so the PM isn't having to chase things down at that really deep level. And that's just an agreement we have with engineering management so that they do have the oxygen to go out of the building. If you do your homework well up front, there are fewer questions for the engineers when you're in the build phase two. So if you come in with a high fidelity prototype, there's not as many questions as you get when the thing's not very well formed. So a lot of PMs spend the time answering questions live that could have been answered up front if you'd done the homework. So I guess I would assume with that, the engineering team probably likes that you all are able to work this way. Because yeah. by the time something gets to them, Zero pushback. <laughs> yeah, they're like, all right, this is exactly what you want. Are there other parts of organizations that are less likely to be so supportive of significant amounts of research up front? Oh, sales, customer success, people who are on the hook to resolve high-intensity high customer requests. Like, okay. they want us to make a decision quick. They want to see us building that thing right away. Yeah. And we're not always willing to move as fast as they would like. Um, got a couple more here. So uh, one of the ones that uh, I think people are curious about as well is, uh, especially in agile teams are saying, oftentimes the product team is focused on the next big feature. Like, oh, you know, clients want us to do this or we're gonna make this big change and we're gonna have this, this new ability. But how do you think about one, fixing bugs in your current offering uh, and, and then with that too, how much of that like legacy code and offering you're going to keep supporting before it's too much and you got to start dropping off some of those old offerings and features. Anybody want it? 
we're not very good at killing features here. Um, <laughs> but we do take a, a lot of um, time and put it aside for technical initiatives. Um, we have um, a, a really kind of, well, on, on, my, on my program, on the HiFi side, um, a very kind of decentralized, kind of like Adam Smith, invisible hand. You know, here's, here's our big initiative. Here's where we need to go. Um, you know, really empower the engineers uh, to kind of go about that. And I think when you, when you put the agency in the engineer's hands, they organically just think about, all right, I can solve this problem and also kind of clean up some classes or kind of go in and make sure when they build it that they don't have to touch that code again for two years. And that's kind of how we're trying to solve it. Um, but it, for even each of those agile teams handles it differently. I just think the fewer times you have to touch something, the more efficient you get stuff out. So just deploying code that's not buggy is really important. Um, and, and like having stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be QA'd by the rest of the team, you still go through that process, but not having to do it ends up just mathematically being a lot less time spent on something. Um, but then I, there, there's a project that we work on, uh, where the, we work, we're partnered with a guy who's a CTO. He worked at Amazon, he worked at Facebook, he worked at Google. And I heard him, and we actually went through a full day of safe training, the scaled, scaled agile. And he through it, raised his hand and was like, I don't like that. I like to be able to give my developers as a reward, um, the ability to go back and clean up their code that they had to race through to finish. And if they're able to get through, um, and I don't remember what the exact turn or the, the phase was that they got through, but I think that was also interesting. Like in engineers and developers inherently don't like to ship stuff that's not good. Um, so figuring out how to use that as a incentive was just interesting to me. I don't know how you'd use that or not, but. Yeah, so I think. For us, it really depends. Um, we definitely race through features. Um, you're not the only team that does that and the engineers hate it, obviously. Nobody likes to build up tech debt. Um, so we manage that in a couple of different ways. One, we have a firefighter. Um, so it's an engineer that's always on call um, to handle anything that's on fire, which has been really helpful for us. One, I don't have to go around and figure out, okay, which engineer built this? Who do I need to talk to to get this fixed? Um, we have a firefighter that kind of triages all of that. Um, we also have a technical project manager who helps with that as well, which has been um, honestly a godsend since that happened, um, which is only a couple of months now. So it also helps to kind of refine that process. In terms of kind of paying down tech debt, um, our engineering team uses that whenever they're building a new feature, if we have a little bit more time, they'll, they'll use that time to kind of clean some of that up. Um, probably a lot of other engineering teams do that as well. And then we have a slow period in our business. Um, it's about around December, around the holidays, people aren't decorating their homes, they're buying Christmas gifts. Um, and so we'll use that as an opportunity to do this, what we call a cleanup sprint. And it's where we, um, ahead of that, the PMs and the engineers will get together to rank kind of our highest priority bugs. Um, um, to just kind of tackle during this cleanup sprint before we ramp back up um, and get busy again. Um, one systematic way to deal with this, we have three buckets. We have tech debt, iterative improvements to stuff that's already out there, and then net new things. And so the net new, we've moved through that process that I showed up top. Tech debt, don't have to go through through it, iterative improvements don't have to go through it. These are well understood things. Uh, and so we just assign budgets. So in any given time period, on balance, it's been about 10% tech debt, about 30% iterative improvements, and the rest on net new needle moving stuff. And if you agree to that, then the engineers have the space in the elbow room to chip away on tech debt mm. as they go. I think this was the single most helpful move that we made in, in knocking down tech debt because we had a big pile of it at one point. And rather than just stopping everything and going to fix tech debt, if you give them that oxygen, every, each and every sprint, it tends to keep it at bay. Yeah. So we have a, a couple more, So, and I want to be careful of time. So whoever, one or two people want to answer this, um, as, a, as a developer, uh, if I'm noticing things in the process that are, I just don't feel like I are ideal or are problematic, how can I, uh, you know, share those with the product managers without being to quote, you know, a huge pain in the ass. Uh, any thoughts on that from anybody? 
Retros? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Retros? Fair. Love it. One more to answer. Very succinct. Um, if not, take them out for a beer. Yeah. Also get that. <laughs> a little more informal. Um, uh, for, for folks, this one comes from somebody that's thinking about uh, transitioning into product management. Um, from a process perspective, is there anything there that's important for them to know? Uh, there's so many processes, so it's hard to be like, okay, well, you should learn A. But uh, when you're looking at hiring product managers, um, how important or not is it that they know anything about the process that you all utilize uh, coming in? I think it's good from a resume perspective. Um, it'll get you in the door, but honestly, process at every single company is going to be different. I think having the fundamentals down and knowing, you know, the difference between agile and safe and Kanban and like different methodologies is, is helpful to know. Um, but once you get into a company, you'll find that their version of agile might be different from a previous company. So I think it's good to get you in the door, but I think there are other skills that are honestly much more important to focus on when um, you're transitioning into product, if I'm being honest. I, I actually, I don't think they should learn any processes first. Um, I, I think the, the, the intangibles of product management is knowing what to build and why to build it. And so when I get asked, how do I get into product management? I, I don't, don't pick up a safe book. Don't learn about agile to start, go build a website with a customer and figure out how you build that. It is so easy to build websites now. Go to Squarespace, 24 bucks a month, and try and build a website and sell that. I think you then self-taught learn how to build something, how to interact with a customer, and make sure that you don't put buttons all over that page. Um, because we all are four really cool companies in Denver, all four different processes. There's no way you're gonna learn it all. But one thing that, that transcends all of that is shipping product. And if you know how to do that with your own hands, um, I'm not saying learn how to code. You can do these things with drag and drop, um, but it's, for me, it's been the most impactful thing because my background's unorthodox. I did not know anything about product management um, six years ago. Yeah, accumulate the skills and you can do any process. Uh, if you just learn one process, you still have to figure out the skills to go through it. I'd say prioritization is super, super important. And then if you want to learn a skill that's specifically around process, it's sequencing. Uh, what should I put first? that will have the least downstream impacts or will set me up for success on the rest of the process. Um, everything should lead into the next thing. If you're doing something that you then have to go back and do something else to make it whole, that's probably not great. Agree with all that. Well, I don't care that much about process for people that are coming in. We, in addition to everything that was mentioned, we're looking for people that think systematically to be a good PM, you got to really be able to work a problem. So we do a case uh, question in the interview process. We're looking for people who think the way we want them to think and for who are customer first, who will be comfortable interviewing, will want to lean in on that phase. Those are the things we screen for. Awesome. Cool. So I think we're going to end here. Um, this has been awesome. So first of all, I want to let everybody know that uh, – I think folks are going to hang around for a couple minutes. Uh, so if you have questions, come up and ask them. I'll remind you that on the slide, if you do want, oh, I keep moving my computer. If you do want the uh, uh, kind of notes and stuff emailed to you from today, uh, throw your email on the link up there at billy.com forward slash DSW dash product. But most important thing, thank you to GoSpot Check and thank you to all the panelists. So let's give them a hand. Thank you.